Thank you very much, Dr. Good morning, everybody. I want to uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for today's uh, biweekly uh, press briefing. Uh, we do have what we think is a very important announcement uh, today uh, to announce the Metropolitan Police Department's new uh, body-worn camera uh, pilot uh, program. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined by our chief, uh, Catherine Denier, um, and also our uh, Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, uh, Paul Quander, who is here. Thank you, Paul, for being here uh, as well. Uh, MPD and public safety partners have been planning this uh, for this day uh, for months, in fact, uh, the better part of a year, uh, around a year, and we're excited to be able to share the details of this pilot uh, with you uh, today. Uh, as the Chief will tell you in just a few minutes, um, testing body cameras on officers uh, is a way to uh, foster uh, transparency, more, even more transparency in law enforcement. Uh, and uh, improve police services and community relations, uh, as well as enhance uh, public safety. Uh, through funding that I was actually pleased to be able to include in our fiscal year 14 supplemental uh, budget uh, that we got through this past May, uh, we were able to move forward uh, with this pilot uh, that we think, we hope, will be very successful and then can be expanded upon. Uh, let me put this into some context uh, at this stage. Um, even though we've been working on the pilot for months, uh, and there are people who have already asked me if the police shooting of uh, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, was the uh, motivation, the impetus uh, for this, uh, and to what extent community response to that around the country uh, elevated our uh, efforts, uh, let me make it clear that uh, one, we believe the cameras have a role in helping to uh, prevent and solve crimes and that we have been working on this situation long before uh, the uh, situation uh, occurred, before this occurred in uh, Ferguson, uh, Missouri, the shooting that took place there. Um, the uh, Metropolitan Police Department uh, and the district um, have understood the importance of implementing cutting edge tools uh, that enhance the crime fighting capabilities of our uh, uh, police force uh, here in the city. And the body camera is yet another technique, another approach in being able to do that. Um, when I look at what is occurring throughout the country, uh, and I do pay a lot of attention to this, many of you know that I go regularly to the mayor's meetings uh, that are held, uh, and there are anywhere from two to three hundred mayors, uh, sometimes more, who uh, attend those meetings, uh, it gives me an opportunity to pay close attention to what's happening uh, in urban centers uh, around the uh, nation. Um, and frankly, uh, I'm very favorably impressed with our Metropolitan Police Department when I look at what we're doing with our MPD and what's happening in other uh, policing around the uh, nation. Uh, we are a leader uh, in technology and uh, we think in uh, policing efforts uh, as well. Um, I want to commend the chief uh, for her leadership and her uh, foresight in helping us to continue to be at the cutting edge of policing and law enforcement uh, in the nation. Um, I also want to thank the uh, men and women who work on uh, MPD uh, for the work that they do uh, each day to keep our uh, city uh, safe. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't look at the crime statistic and that statistics and that is absolutely the truth. Every morning I get up, I look at the crime data <laughs> and uh, have had discussions with people being able to use the, that data as a uh, focal point for the discussion. I've had people come to me and say we ought to be doing this and we ought to be doing that, we need a special initiative on this and I've said well, why don't you look at the data? The data will take you in the direction that we need to go. Uh, I've had that discussion around homicides. Uh, our robberies are down by more than 20% uh, in the District of Columbia, and other important uh, foci, uh, measures, if you will, of crime are down uh, as well. So in addition to commending the chief, I want to commend the other uh, 4,000 of our uh, officers who work hard uh, every day to keep our uh, city uh, safe. 
Um, I guess the bottom line is that we believe that the uh, body-worn cameras will enhance police work uh, in our city, uh, especially at a time when our population is steadily growing, that we're adding 1,000 to 1,200 people uh, each month. We now have 660,000 people who live in the District of Columbia. It is the largest population that we've had since the 1970s, and there is every indication that our population will continue uh, to grow. And we want to make sure that we have a, uh, a uh, crime-fighting, a law enforcement apparatus that it continues to be contemporary uh, as well. And the uh, body-worn cameras will help us continue to be able to do that. So with that said, I want to ask Chief Lanier uh, if she will come up and talk about uh, how the uh, cameras will be used and the potential benefits uh, of the uh, body-worn cameras to uh, fighting crime. Uh, here in the uh, District of Columbia. Chief? So I see our models are coming up. <laughs> so we have a couple of different uh, models here. Um, we are, so the, this rollout, the pilot project that we're rolling out, um, and you can see they're wearing different models, different styles of cameras. Um, we're going to be testing five different camera styles. So we're going to involve about 160 officers. They're each going to try each of the cameras. So. All the officers that are involved in the pilot will try each of the cameras so they can get a sense of, um, you know, the decision we have to make now is which camera is the most comfortable for the officers um, in terms of ease of, you know, positioning and use. You can see there's some head mounted, there's some collar mounted, there's some that are mounted on the shirt. Um, which captures the video that were that is most advantageous for us? Um, and then the storage uh, solutions are, are also part of this decision. Every uh, make of camera has different solutions for storage. Um, and then, you know, the ability to charge the equipment, make sure it's ready for uh, long tours of duty and it makes it through a, you know, a kind of rugged shift. So we're, we're t being very cautious about this because it's a big investment for us. But we spent uh, almost 18 months now researching this to narrow it down to the, to the five models that we have. So this is the last uh, part of the evaluation for us. We have uh, a pretty solid final policy. Um, we have collaborated with major city chiefs around the country, Police Executive Research Forum, ACLU, uh, and many other uh, groups to make sure we have a solid policy. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, details that go into a rollout of something of, the, of this nature. Uh, we also uh, collaborated with the FOP. I want to acknowledge uh, Chairman of the FOP, Delroy Burton, is here. The FOP has been uh, instrumental in helping us work through a lot of the policy issues. Um, and right now, I think uh, for the officers who volunteered for the pilot, um, we all realize that you know we've implemented a lot of technology here in Washington, D.C. A lot of the technology we roll out is to make officers safer, to make them more efficient, make them more effective. And this is just another uh, way for us to do all of that and to you know kind of reduce some of the workload. You know, frontline supervisors spend an awful lot of time going back and doing investigations based on, you know, four or five different people's opinion on what happened on a scene. Well, now we'll have a video. Um, and, you know, people's opinions often vary on a scene on interactions between a police officer and a, and a citizen, interactions with an officer in the process of making an arrest. So this gives us that independent, unbiased witness. Um, that will, you know, help us kind of sort through what is normal in a police investigation of a variety of opinions from a variety of different people. So this will make our officers safer. It will make our department more transparent. It will, you know, reduce the amount of time that supervisors have to spend investigating um, allegations. And the more time the supervisors can spend on the street uh, supporting police officers, then, uh, you know, the better off we all are. So um, this is the first group we're going to roll out uh, October 1st. Um, the officers so far have been um, cautiously optimistic uh, about how easy it's going to be to uh, to use these things when they go out. So the way the program will work is as soon as they are dispatched or a call is initiated and given to the officer, either initiated by the officer or given to the officer, they will activate the camera. The camera will remain on throughout the entire incident um, until they have cleared and left the scene. So as they're clearing whatever the scene is, if it's processing arrest or whatever they're once they finish that uh, call, then they will turn the camera off. Um, the policy is extensive, so I could sit here and go through all 10, 12 pages uh, of what requirements are, but it's basically for the officer, any uh, interaction they have, 
um, they are going to initiate recording. Those recordings, if they're not part of a criminal investigation or administrative investigation of some sort, those recordings will be destroyed after 90 days. Um, so there is a process for FOIA requests. That is one of the probably more complicated issues uh, for us in terms of the volume of requests that we get. And then, re you know, redaction of video is going to be a, a big challenge for us because it is a, you know, lo a lot of process. You figure as we roll this out, we're going to have officers 24 hours a day, seven days a week out on the street wearing these cameras. That's an awful lot of video, uh, a lot of you, and a lot of, uh, you know, management of the, those video um, once we go out. So we're kind of working through some of those things right now, but we're excited to have uh, the officers go out. And I'm going to give you a short video so you can see um, exactly what this is going to look like for us uh, as it rolls out. So why don't we roll the video and then um, we'll take questions. Our little actress is sitting in the back of the room back there. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Patrols and with DC Police. We're going to stop you doing 45 and 35. Can I see your license registration, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just late for work. I understand. I also want to advise you that me and my partner, Officer Coakley, are both wearing cameras today. Ma'am, I need to see your driver's license. your library card. <laughs> you we actually insurance? think that she didn't do that by accident. That was... Please remain seated in your vehicle. I'll be with you in a few minutes. Three zero four nine. Three zero four nine. Yes, ma'am, dispatcher. Be advised, we're at the forty six hundred block of Blue Plains Avenue Southeast with a traffic stop. I'm at forty six hundred block of Blue Plains. Southwest. How many times did occupied? The vehicle was occupied one time. I have one to run when you're ready. DC tag. I'm ready. DC tag of Adam Henry George, 349. try to demonstrate in this video is the entire interaction between the officer and the um, the officers and the, the person on the stop is recorded. A lot of times we'll get complaints on officers um, that require an investigation that is something that is as simple as, you know, a, when the officer made the traffic stop, um, he made me sit in the car for an unusually long period of time and I think he did that just to be kind of you know, just to be kind of punitive, uh, why, why do you make me sit there so long? And so if somebody comes and makes that complaint at the station, right now we have to, you know, get complaint numbers and do an investigation where we have to interview people, do a written report. And as you see from this interaction, if the officer did everything they were supposed to do and the only delay was running the information through the computer and we see that it wasn't, and believe me, when you're sitting there on the other side of a traffic stop, it might seem like a really long time. Um, this way we have all the facts and we can sometimes, you know, Clear that up right then and there, you know, be, go back to the station, be able to download video, look at that video, and then, you know, avoid having a lengthy investigation and explain to the 
person, you know, that, you know, hey, this is just part of what the officer's job is. The entire interaction took two and a half minutes. And, you know, we realize that sometimes that feels a little different uh, when you're the one inside of the car that's been stopped. But so this will help us tremendously in terms of, you know, avoiding a lot of those lengthy investigations and being able to explain things um, clearly to a, a member of the community who doesn't understand why uh, during the course of a traffic stop they had to sit in the car and wait. So um, I'd like to give um, the chairman of the union a, an opportunity to make a few comments if uh, you want, Delroy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Delroy Burton. I'm the chairman of the D.C. Police Union. And I would just like to echo some of the chief's comments. One of the big reasons we are in full support of this program is because in all jurisdictions where this has been implemented, complaints against police officers have been reduced. Uh, wh what that will do for us as a union and as an agency is it will significantly reduce our administrative load. Uh, frivolous complaints, false complaints will no longer be made alleging that an officer said something that there is nowhere to ver no way possible that we could verify. With the body-worn camera, all the interaction will be recorded. It's no longer he said, she, she said, we can go back and we can review that document, we can review that film, review the audio, and quickly clear the matter up. It's all, it also enhances officer safety as well as the public safety because people behave differently when they know they're being recorded. It, the citizens behave differently, officers will behave differently, and we believe the outcome will be uh, better interaction between the members that I represent, the public uh, at large, citizens, employees that work here, and visitors to the District of Columbia. And I want to commend the chief and everyone that's worked on this program. Uh, we have been working on this for quite some time, and uh, we are pleased to lend our support to the Body Worn Camera Program. Thank you, Chief. All right, we'll open it up for any questions that you all may have about this, um, this effort. Martin. The officer activates the camera. So as soon as they, as, as soon as they're um, dispatched to a call, as soon as they turn on their lights, as soon as they, to make a traffic stop, as soon as they, a call is initiated to the officer, they will start the recording. Um, once they are clear and departing from that call, then they'll deactivate. So the policy makes it clear. Um, there's there's some exceptions to recording, um, but very few. So um, you know we'll be able to go back and review if a if an officer turns that camera off. Certainly, if something if there's an allegation, um, we're going to go back and look for that video. Yes. So um, any place where there's a you know, reasonable expectation of privacy, obviously the officer is not going to use the camera, so locker rooms, uh, you know, restrooms, things of that nature. But if they're on an official call for service uh, and are lawfully uh, at a premises, uh, they're going to be recording. I mean, that's, uh, that's all the whole point of the uh, video. Um, in terms of citizen complaints, and you know, a lot of times the complaints we get are very similar to what I described, you know, a misunderstanding of what uh, what the the actions of the officer are and and sometimes it is you know a he said she said and people get frustrated on both sides both police officers and community members when it's you know an officer and an individual and one says one thing one says something else we can't really substantiate that we have two people telling us two different stories and unless we have something to support one side over the other that investigation, which takes weeks, <laughs> you know, to complete written investigation to, to kind of exhaust all, you know, means, uh, will come back as a, is a unfounded, I mean, or, or unsubstantiated, because we can't, you know, prove or disprove the allegation. And that's frustrating for everybody, because the officer feels like, well, wait a minute, I said I didn't do it and you didn't vindicate me, you just said it's unsubstantiated. And the citizen says, I said that the officer said this and you didn't support my position either. So this helps that tremendously. Well, here's the, here's the driver for me, you know, as the, as the chief. With supervisors on the street, you know, the, the, the first line supervisors are the most important people in the Metropolitan Police Department. Their job is to be out there on the street supporting those officers to make sure that they're, they have what they need, they're doing what they're supposed to, and they're getting all the support from the supervisor that are supposed to manage, you know, the police 
deployments and conduct. Um, if those supervisors are spending one complaint, the traffic stop complaint I gave you, that they, uh, you know, that scenario, the officers have, the sergeant has up to 90 days to fully investigate that. So they gotta go and take statements from multiple people. They've gotta look for video, that, the area. That will take that supervisor off the street for several days conducting that investigation and writing up a final report. If we can clear that up with the video and avoid that, we get about, oh, I wanna say, I, I, I can't give you exact numbers off the top, top of my head, but let's say I get 300 complaints a year. Take that 300 complaints and multiply it times even 10 days of supervisor's time off the street. That's a tremendous impact on us. So efficiency-wise, what we've seen from other police departments, complaints go down 80% on average. So 80% reduction in complaints in administrative investigation time. And what we've seen from police departments around the country is they've been able to, to decrease the size of their internal affairs bureaus by up to half because the complaints have dropped so dramatically. I can get it to you, I just don't walk around with that in my head. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, Robert McPherson from AFP, French News Agency. Uh, yeah, I was gonna ask the number of complaints question as well, and number of man hours, so you know, if you want to look into sure. that later, that would be great. But also in the case of a major incident, um, and you have 10 and 20 officers going to the scene of a homicide, for instance, uh, are like all 10 or 20 cameras Every officer that's on an assignment, responding to an assignment, we're required to turn their cameras on, so they will all be on. And you, you make a, a, a allude to another point, we also could use these on very active scenes for training purposes as well. Um, obviously, we always review any incidents where officers are issued, I mean, are, are injured, or any um, instances where officers are using force. We can use those to help identify better tactics and better training for our police officers to reduce the number of officer injuries and uses of force. So there's a lot of value to the cameras. No, no, I mean, that's not the point of the camera. The point of the camera is to have a record if there is an inquiry or if there's an allegation or if there's a crime that's gotta be investigated. It is not a tool to, you know, um, you know, use as a gotcha or to, you know, to check in on officers. I mean, we believe the officers that for the most part are gonna follow policy and do what they're supposed to do and if they don't, we get a complaint, we go back and pull the video. But it's not gonna be used to, you know, kinda do random checks on police officers. I know you will, Tom. <laughs> So right now there's a little bit of a learning curve for us. We know that one of the biggest challenges for departments around the country that have implemented the use of the body cameras, and they're all much, much smaller deployments than ours, is compliance with FOIA. Um, there's a short turnaround, turnaround time for FOIA, and if we're gonna have to pull video, review it, and redact it, um, that's a human being that's doing it. We're trying to find some analytical software that'll assist us with you know, redacting faces and identifying information. Um, in those cases, so we're really kind of testing to see how long it's gonna take us to be able to do that, and if we need to make some modifications to the FOIA process to be able to comply. I mean, right now, our turnaround time is very, very short given the number of complaints or requests that we get. So it, it's gonna be tough, I think. We're gonna have to probably add some staffing to, to deal with that. Six months, six months total, but I, I think maybe a little bit shorter than that, but we're giving it six months on the same side. Yes, it, it, when practical, there are some circumstances where an officer may get out uh, in an extremely hostile or active environment. If it is practical, they, they are required to give the notice, but there are some exceptions again. 80%. Both. Both, yes.
So even uh, in, in interview processes of, of victims, it is common for us, uh, even we do uh, interviews of victims now at stations, we sometimes you know, video those interviews. Um, uh, yes, they can make a request and there'll be a decision process, but most often if we're there investigating a crime, that camera's gonna remain on. Now we wouldn't, certainly wouldn't release that video. But you know, victim statements are a critical part of any criminal prosecution going forward. And so having that video or not maintaining that video could be problematic for us if we don't. Yes. I mean, ideally it would be one, but I don't want to say conclusively that's going to be the decision. Um, we have some equipment that we deploy that we deploy two different kinds, uh, just because it's preference for different officers and different assignments. So we may end up selecting more than one kind. I mean, ideally it would be, you know, one particular camera because the storage and charging and all that stuff will be similar, the same. But we may find that for plain clothes operations or specialized mission units, there's a different type of camera we want to use. So we just don't know yet. And on the, on the money side, obviously you have the funding for this pilot program. Did you identify the funding that will get out the entire course? Is there a timeline on that? Yeah, so what we're, I mean, once we, we have to select a camera first of all and estimate the data storage size. Those are all going to play into the cost. And then we will try and factor it into the budget. We have set aside, um, you know, in the budget cycle that has, you know, been completed, all right, we have set aside some money for our technology enhancements to keep going forward. But I would imagine this is probably going to be a two to three year rollout for the entire agency. Just, you know, guessing on the, the cost. This is costing us about a million, but that's not just for the cameras. I think we have a total of how many cameras did we get? Two, 250 cameras. But that's, it's all the infrastructure that goes along with it as well. So that's um, servers for data storage, uh, chargers, and some other stuff. So, um, you know, we'll probably phase this in over two or three years to roll it out. But, you know, the ideal is to have it on patrol officers first and some of the officers that are out there on the front line having the most contact. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, we're we're very fortunate here in Washington. We have a you know great relationship uh, with the intelligence community, the FBI. We have been continually briefed um, and are very aware of uh, you know what the situations uh, that we're we're watching are. The mayor included. <laughs> You know, it's 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 kind of hard to, to put into a saving lives uh, quantity, but I think what it can do for us is is support evidence, support witness statements, and help with criminal prosecution and violent offenses and, and other offenses. And also, it saves us an awful lot of time um, for officers down the street. And you know, certainly assaults on police officers. Um, we're hoping that it will reduce that. And that thing to contact the officers. Sure. I mean, I, like, like we say, you know, it's very rare that we're not being videotaped somewhere by somebody anyway. I mean, you, we're the last people to get cameras, right? <laughs> I mean, we're being videotaped every day, so we're like the last one of the bunch to get cameras. So now we'll, we'll have ours as well. <sighs> all right, thank you all very much. Uh, you have one, Andrew? So um, one vendor has two or two different mounts, I believe. One that kind of wraps around behind your head and has the camera that right above the ear. So almost is just exactly what you would see from the eye level. Um, and has other options for glass mounts. So the options are collar mount, uh, the one that goes around your head, a pair with glasses with a camera on the side, one that goes, you know, attaches to your shirt. That's the ones that we're testing, right? Yeah. All of those? 
Yes. So that's the different models that we're looking at. And really, we're, we're trying to evaluate um, not just the durability and the, you know, the quality of the video, the cameras, but the ease of use for officers. You know, uh, if the uh, one that mounts on the shirt becomes cumbersome getting in and out of the car with a seatbelt, um, you know, that may not be the best option. So we want them to actually use it in the environment they work in every day and then tell us which one is the best. We're testing five. One vendor has two different styles. We're testing both. All right. Thank you. All right. Those who were here just for this, uh, you're welcome to depart uh, if you like. Uh, we'll now open it up for uh, other questions that uh, folks may have. Martin. Come back, Chief. As you guys know, the council just came with a couple of questions. But there's a couple of questions that were raised. One of them was about when a resident can ask the state guard to come and break the window after they see them break the window and say they're threatened. What are the residents of Mike and his people who feel threatened by the threat? So I, I think I'm going to defer that to either the legal counsel or the to the um, council staff because I, I I've not been involved in some of those discussions and since it's on the legislative side I'd rather let them answer that question. Yeah. We'll get the we'll get the attorney general uh, to get an answer for you, Martin. And uh, Doxy, where'd Doxy go? Oh, can you get back to him with an answer on that? The question, the question was whether somebody can brandish a gun or I guess if they feel under duress and they pull a gun, you know, what, what legal uh, authority do they have to be able to demonstrate that they have a weapon, right? And uh, I, I agree with the chief. Let's let the uh, attorney general's yeah. office answer that. So I think uh, following the introduction of the legislation, there'll be rulemaking, and the rulemaking will kind of narrow things down a little bit more and give us a little bit more clarity. I don't see it as being extremely vague. Um, so um, if we, you know, look at um, what has been done in other jurisdictions, you can narrow it down pretty, you know, significantly so that you're, you're have, you have a process by which everybody's request can be evaluated fairly without that, you know, broad um, disparity. Well, I mean, none of us have a crystal ball. Um, since Heller um, allowed registration of handguns,